So welcome everyone to the April Astrophotography SIG meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. And this is also our last SIG meeting of our inaugural season. And I think it's been an excellent season. We'll talk about the future of the SIG here later tonight. But uh, before we jump into uh, uh, discussion, we have a fantastic uh, uh, speaker tonight. He, you could say he's a guest speaker, but of course he's a member. So give you a little bit of background here. Uh, our, our guest speaker first joined the KAS when it was actually known as the Kalamazoo Astronomy Club in 1968. And he served in a variety of club positions up to the mid 1990s. And so these include like multiple terms as president, uh, perhaps several terms as treasurer, or secretary, newsletter editor, Alcor. There could be some I'm leaving out, but you get the idea. So uh, he, he, he was a big influence on the club in the 70s, 80s, uh, into the 90s, and even today. So in August of 1969, he became a volunteer at the old Hans Baldoff Planetarium at the Kalamazoo Public Museum, which was at the time above the Kalamazoo Public Library, and he became its coordinator in September of 1985. And I met him just about two short years later, because it's around that time in 1987, that I took a astronomy class at Lori Norrick's high school. And as part of the class, we made regular visits to the planetarium. I think it was every Tuesday, but I can't remember. That was, that was such a long time ago. And that's where I first started to see him, but I got to know him a lot more when I started working at the Kalamazoo Public Museum in 1989. And I was there for the next six, uh, nine years, uh, roughly six of which were working in the planetarium. Uh, where I got to know Eric even more. And, you know, I, of course I know him, but I, I, I don't like him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he, he was, again, early on my uh, uh, astronomy mentor. He was the first person to show me how to take astro photos. Uh, the very first photos he kind of showed me how to take were uh, meteor uh, images, you know, just doing short constellation photos and hoping you could capture meteors in them. And it wasn't too long after that I tried a few star trails, which, of course, is the topic of tonight's meeting. So he finally retired from the uh, now Kalamazoo Valley Museum in June of 2015. Uh, along the way, he earned a, a BS in Earth Science in 1985, but a, a Master's in Science Education in 1998. Uh, both of which were from WMU, Western Michigan University, for those of you joining us out of state. And of course, today he captures images of the heavens from his backyard, steer in the garden observatory. I'm sure I butchered that a little bit, but you, you get the idea. So without any further ado, please welcome Eric Schreuer. So... Have you got sound? Nod, wave, let me know. Okay, real quick, I'd like to just get an idea. Uh, are there any people out there who are really beginners at this, who have not had some experience before? Uh, if, if you're a beginner, go ahead and get into your little chat button down on the bottom of your screen and click on the waving hand and I'll get a quick look at who's a beginner. I see a couple of them showing up. Okay. Um, the, the original title of the program is uh, Let the Earth Turn, and it's about photographing star trails. And you've already got the, a quick background of me. In fact, you've gotten quite a bit more of a background than I'm going to give you here right now. So, uh, uh, I'd like to say that this all got started, oh, back somewhere around the summer of 1969. So I want to turn the earth backwards right now to 1969 and uh, see a couple of the things that were going on back in those days. Uh, first, the thing that stood out the most was that the Apollo 11 voyage to the moon and back. Uh, they were launched July 16th, landed on July 20th, and uh, a few days later returned. At the same time, most people didn't notice it, but uh, Mariner 6 
and Mariner 7 flew by the planet Mars, sending back close-up pictures showing craters on the planet. Um, I guess I'll have to let you see that as well. Um, there was something going on out on the West Coast at that time. A computer at Caltech and uh, Sanford universities were connected to form the first leg of ARPANET, which stands for the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. This was uh, kind of the very, very far back beginning that eventually led to the internet. And not long after that, the first packet of information was sent from one computer to another. And we got uh, communication between computers. And uh, a few years later, emails became possible, which uh, that technology all brought us together today. Well, the same year, another device was invented, the charge coupled device or CCD, which became a, a tool which we're gonna find out a whole lot about tonight because that's what makes what we're doing so easy to do nowadays. So that's the summer of 69. That same year, I got my uh, certificate to operate the planetarium in Kalamazoo. Um, you've already heard that. There I am, way back in those days when I had a head full of hair. And uh, this uh, apparently was an astronomy club meeting taking place in the planetarium at that time. Hey, Eric, you're not showing any slides. It sounds like you're referring to slides that you're not sharing. You're not seeing slides? No. Oh, tell you what. I need to turn myself off. Does that show? Yes, it is. Okay. So we'll real, real quick go back through the summer of 69, the voyage to the moon, the Mariner 6 and 7, computers at Caltech and Sanford, data packets going between computers, charge couple devices are invented, and there we have uh, a planetarium operator certificate, an astronomy club meeting taking place in the old Hans Baldoff planetarium, and uh, we were also planning our first solar eclipse expedition, which all those things seems like they're repeating. Okay, so we'll jump ahead into the future. And as a result of uh, my, my work on the program, I actually changed the title. So it's Happy Trails to You. And uh, it's about photographing nightscapes, time lapse, and star trails. But the guy who did it is still the same guy, and uh, he still belongs to the same astronomy club. Okay, first a few little definitions. A nightscape. Uh, a nightscape is a landscape image that's photographed under moonlight or starlight. Um, some people will do them under city lights as well at night, but I prefer the moonlight or starlight. In this case, it's a photograph of the Kwamanan Falls at the Kwamanan Falls State Park. There is a rising, nearly full moon. This was shot in uh, September, around Labor Day. And the way I would know that is because the trip that I made was to walk the Mackinac Bridge. So this is a nightscape, nighttime scene, just kind of a, a, a normal picture lit by moonlight or starlight. Time lapse, that's when you take a whole series of pictures, put them together and turn them into a movie clip. In this case, we're looking at uh, the Milky Way drifting across the sky. This is photographed at Boone Hill Observing Site, which is near Cadillac, Michigan. And it was shot in the month of June, I can tell that, by how far east the Milky Way started moving across the sky. We're just about to uh, moonrise, and things change a little bit. Okay, and finally, uh, let's see, we've done our uh, nightscape, we've done our time lapse, so we're up to our star trail. 
Star Trail is a single image which shows the motions of the night sky. And uh, if you look closely, you might be able to identify the location. Uh, a good close look will show that I caught something else on the picture too. The location was at Miner's Castle in the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore up on Lake Superior. And that little dash of three lines up there, that is uh, one of the Iridium satellites. So star trail, single image, time lapse, multiple images shown as a video clip, and a nightscape is a single image. I think I've got the definitions out of the way. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, the way early days when I first did this. I got started back in 1969. Uh, the summer is 1969. What I would do, I, I grabbed one of my father's cameras. It uh, was a, uh, an old camera that used 120 roll film. And you could get either uh, Tri-X or Plus-X. Tri-X had a speed of 400. Plus-X had a speed of 125. You put it in your camera, you go out with a camera on a tripod, and you had a, uh, a, a cable release, which was uh, like a little plunger that would push down on the shutter, and it had a little locking screw, so you could lock the camera lens open. And I took pictures of the northern constellations from a schoolyard about a block away from where I lived, then I would take my roll of film home, go back and uh, process the roll of film in the dark room in the basement and do my own prints. And I was pretty proud. I'd do pictures that were maybe five minutes long doing some simple constellation work, kind of like the picture it's showing here. Uh, Cassiopeia, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, which is what's in the image here. That was back in the old days. Now, by now, you've read some of the information here. You could buy your film in rolls of 24 or 36 exposures that cost you, oh, about 60 cents a picture. And then you had to have your film processed. If uh, you were doing color slide film, you'd take it to uh, uh, film processing where it would be about 10 to $15 for a roll of film, depending on how many exposures you had. And you had to wait a couple of weeks because it was mailed in and then mailed back to uh, the processor. And uh, finally, you get your pictures to look at them. So you didn't have immediate results. Um, this shot uh, is the Little Dipper. And uh, if you see the star that's just kind of a little pinpoint up at the top, that's Polaris, and you can see uh, the, the pointer stars of the Little Dipper down near the bottom of the picture. So that gives you an idea of the scale. Well, nowadays we can do it a little bit easier. Digital photography makes things go faster, easier, and you get a whole lot of advantages. Um, the uh, images are stored as digital files on uh, usually an SD chip that you can take out of the camera, plug into your computer, download your pictures, and then work on them in uh, a variety of different kinds of software. Uh, when you're out in the field, you can preview your images as you're working on them on an LCD screen on the back of the camera. And that allows you to uh, really be able to get a better idea of what you're doing than you could in the old days so that uh, you can see things and you can make adjustments before you actually start investing time in taking a lot of pictures. Uh, this is a sample shot, uh, Canon 60DA camera, uh, wide angle lens. You can see the little dipper also in this picture. It's uh, not hanging down from uh, Polaris. It's actually uh, rising up a little bit from Polaris over the top of the tree on the left. And, uh, um, you can see that this is a shorter exposure. It turns out that the uh, digital cameras have better sensitivity for the night sky than the old film cameras had. 
So what we're going to talk about is using a DSLR camera and a tripod to do this. And uh, the uh, camera that I use, actually I use two cameras, a uh, Nikon uh, D5500 and a uh, Canon 60DA. Uh, the DA significate. So uh, what it means is that it's uh, modified for astronomy. It has a chip that is uh, not filtered to black out the infrared so much. It lets the hydrogen alpha light through at the long end of the spectrum. Another piece of equipment that you want to use when you're uh, out doing star trails these days is an intervalometer. And you can see that I've got two different intervalometers here, the one for the Canon and the one for the Nikon. And they're both actually set up to do exactly the same thing. They look a little different and they work a little different. So uh, what each of the controls on them does, if you look uh, across the top, you can read off from the label, let me get my cursor over here, where it says self, it also says self over here. That's a little timer that says, before you do anything, count off this amount of time. So that you can set things up, you can uh, give it a minute, 10 minutes, an hour of time that it's not doing anything before it actually starts running. The second one uh, over here that we're going to pay attention to is the one that says interval. INTVL on one of them and INT period on the other one. And, oh, I'm sorry, we're doing long first, bulb and long. Bulb and long, that's how long the camera lens will be held open for the exposure. And the camera itself needs to be set into the bulb setting. Um, so it's the length of the exposure. Then we get to the interval. And this is the one that depending on which control I'm using, it works differently. On uh, one of them, it's the time between the end of one frame and the beginning of the next frame. On the other one, it's the time between the beginning of a frame and the beginning of the next frame. So you have to include the amount of time of the exposure as well. And that little bit of confusion can sometimes mess me up a little bit. So I have to actually run the first sequence before I know that I've got it set up and programmed correctly. And then uh, the last one is the uh, number or frames. And that's the total number of exposures that you're going to make in the sequence. So when you're uh, ready to go out and collect information, um, what you want to do is uh, grab your stuff. Now, I've got the, the review your camera manual written down up here. And that's an important thing because if you're using a, a camera, even if you're familiar with it, sometimes you forget some of the exotic settings that you need to to use. So I mark those settings. One of the settings that uh, you want to be careful of is the uh, noise reduction setting. You actually want that turned off. Um, if you don't turn it off, when you take pictures, what will happen is it will take a picture, then it will take a second picture of the same length, but without exposing light to it. It's to get the noise from the camera sensor. And then they combine the images and subtract one from the other. Well, if you're doing a star trail and you're on for uh, 30 seconds, and then you're shooting a dark frame for 30 seconds, rather than a nice smooth star trail, what you'll get will be little dashed lines, which you probably don't want to do. So that kind of information, how to set that is inside of your camera manual. 
There's another setting that uh, I turn on and off from time to time. And that one is the setting for uh, uh, making the mirror flip up so that there's a delay time between when the mirror flips up and the picture is taken. I use that when I'm photographing through a telescope because the telescope picks up the vibrations. If I'm not using a telescope, I want that turned off so that there's uh, no delay between when I shoot the picture and when it begins the actual exposure. And uh, uh, a third thing in your manual that you might want to check for um, is, uh, well, I'll come back to it. I forgot for the moment. So the next thing is if you're working with a digital camera, it runs on batteries. And if you're going to be taking a whole series of pictures, you have to make sure that you've got charged batteries. So I will charge my batteries the day before I take them out to use them. And I will also top off my spare battery. And I always carry the battery and spare battery when I go into the field. So that if I run low on power, I can switch over and continue after that. Um, make sure that there is a memory chip and a charged battery in your camera. More than once I have gotten out to an observing site and found out that my memory chip was sitting in the computer at home. And uh, it's too long to drive back home and drive back out and restart. So you just kind of have to have a little checklist to help you remember to have charged batteries and have a memory chip with you whenever you go out. And that's why you should make a packing list. A uh, packing list should include the cameras that you're taking with you. It should include the tripod you're taking with you. It should include the intervalometer, all of the batteries you're taking with you, all of the chips that you're taking with you for your camera, anything that you're going to have out there in the field, because when you're all done at the end of the night, you also want to make sure you take all those things back home again. Otherwise, you're going to be kind of buying things that you wish you'd remembered to bring back with you. And finally, it is helpful to make an imaging plan. And the reason for making an imaging plan is so that uh, when you go out, you've got a rough idea where things are going to be in the sky. You have uh, kind of a, a list of the exposures that you want to take and they're the amount of time that it's going to take to take them so that you know how you're going to use your time out in the field. And once you've done all that, you're ready to go. So there we are out in the field. And in this particular case, I've got two cameras that I'm going to run. I'm going to run them off of a little netbook computer. And it's going to run both of the cameras because it's capable of doing that. It's got a piece of software in it that can do that. And the only thing that was wrong here is that uh, somebody forgot to bring the USB cables to go between the computer and the cameras. So all I could do is take a picture of what setup I had. No pictures came back that night. That's why you make a packing list and that's why you have a plan before you go. But once you get out there with all your equipment and you're ready to go, then what you're doing is you're actually creating a data set. And uh, to make a good data set, you want to find a location where you can shoot without disturbances. Um, I have gone to a number of photography workshops and I've done it to get better at taking pictures. One of the things I've learned is you don't take good pictures at a photography workshop because there are nine other photographers out there with you. They've all got headlamps and flashlights and uh, light coming off the back of their cameras. So there's all kinds of uh, sources of uh, stray light coming at you. 
when you're going to create a, a data set that you're going to work with, you really want to be with just one or two people. And you want to uh, find a location where uh, you're not going to have uh, people driving by constantly, um, where, where you can kind of be in control of your setting. Then you want to set up your tripod and camera and uh, take a couple test exposures to compose the image that you're going to be taking in the viewfinder. So off of the back of the camera, you take a look at the uh, first couple test images. When you make the test images, you shoot them at a really high ISO value. If it's, if it's dark, uh, kick the ISO value up into the uh, 50,000, 60,000 range so that you can get a little bit of the foreground showing. And that will help you to uh, see what your picture is going to look like, then back it down to do the actual data collection. Uh, typically, when I'm doing data collection, I'll be at ISO 1600 or ISO 3200, no more than that but I'll be a lot higher when I'm doing my uh, uh, composition images at the beginning of the night. Shoot a few test shots just to verify your composition and your focus. Focusing is the critical part of doing the uh, star trail and the uh, uh, nightscape photography. If you get good focus, you'll get good pictures in the results. To get the good focus, before you uh, do your composition pictures, go out and find a bright star or planet and point your camera at that. And then uh, go to live mode and then zoom in as much as you can on that bright star to adjust your focus. Once you've got the focus adjusted, one more little trick, take a piece of gaffer's tape and tape the focus ring on your camera so it doesn't move. Then go back and uh, reset your composition and uh, you'll be ready to take good sharp pictures. Then it's time to enter your exposure sequence into the intervalometer, uh, where you'll tell it how long of an exposure to take, how much time between the exposures you want, and how many exposures you want total. And finally, start your sequence and resist the urge to make adjustments. Uh, many times I've gone out and uh, set up and after taking a few pictures, I thought, uh, you know, maybe it'd be uh, a little better if I just shift over this way a little bit. Well, when you make those little adjustments, those little changes, you're actually starting over again from the beginning and it, it eats up the time of your night. So set your sequence up and resist making changes. And in the end, what you'll get will be a whole lot of frames that you can manipulate in a number of ways. So each one of my data sets goes into a folder. And over here, you can see the individual images and you can see that this all belongs to a group that is called 2015 April 18th Boone Hill Circumpolar Facing Northwest. So that tells me what pictures are in there in the name of the folder. And the pictures themselves, I just left the camera name on the images. So they're just numbered images, image uh, 90, 107. Uh, there's probably a few hundred images in here altogether. So once you've got your collection of data, then it's time to go into processing. So you come back home, you get your images transferred from your camera chip into your computer. And depending on uh, what result you want, you use different pieces of software. So for Nightscapes, I use a piece of software. I do everything on PC. 
So I'm going to tell you about PC. But if you're doing uh, your work on uh, uh, Macintosh, there's probably an equivalent piece of software that would do that. So for doing nightscapes, I use a software called Sequator. And the results of Sequator, what they do is they stack the images to, uh, to bring out the, the brightness of the stars. Um, and Sequator allows you to freeze the ground underneath. So it takes the, uh, the central image of the sequence and it kind of locks the ground position in that position. And it uh, uh, goes in and stacks the star frames above it. And that's from uh, the, the data set that you saw just a minute ago that created this image of the constellation Orion, the Milky Way. You can see the Bernard Loop over in Orion over here. You can see the Hyades over here, the Pleiades over here, a Milky Way coming across the top. This would be the area of Auriga up in here, um, Sirius down here. So you can see that this is a really enhanced sky. Now you can take the same set of frames and by running it through a different piece of software, get a different result. So instead of running through Sequator, I need to get my cursor back here. I want to make a time lapse. I'll use Adobe After Effects. And what Adobe After Effects does is it puts your images into a sequence and converts them from still images into an AVI file or a, a move file. And that allows you, I'm going to have to click it one more time here, to create motion sequences. So here's Orion setting. And that's from the same set of uh, data that was used to make the, the the nightscape next to it. And I just got a message that uh, PowerPoint is restarting. It uh, did not like something there. So let me uh, bring it back up. I'm trying to get to uh, where I left off. Hey, Eric, when you get it started again, can you try sharing your screen in a different way? Because your, your screen is visible like in your video window. So I had to kind of spotlight you to see your full screen. And it's, and it's very degraded when I do it that way. OK. Let me. Uh... Do a little change here then. Let's pop into Zoom and share screen. Okay, have you got that? That's much better. You're good to go. Okay. So what you've got now is back to our uh, original data set 
and we're going to jump from there through the equator and the uh, uh, nightscape to Adobe After Effects and the time lapse, which we'll run through here real quickly. And for some reason, it wants to stall there. And finally, uh, making the star trails, I use a uh, piece of software called startrails.exe for that. Um, Sequator and star trails are uh, freeware that, that you can download. After Effects, uh, you got to pay for that. That's part of the uh, Adobe Creative Suite. Um, when you take star trails, what it will do is it will take all of your frames, which are like the individual frame we've got showing down here, and it will put them together one after another into the same image file, and the resulting image looks kind of like the picture that uh, we built up over there. So you can watch it build up over time, and we have uh, the constellation Orion over here setting behind the trees over there. Okay, so now a couple uh, quick recipes. If I'm making nightscapes, I really don't want to use more than about 15 to 20 images. Tw 20 star frames is plenty. Uh, but I also photograph one foreground frame. And the foreground frame, what I'll do is if I'm shooting 20 frames, I'll figure out 20 frames of 30 seconds a piece is about 10 minutes exposure. So I want my foreground frame to also have a 10 minute exposure. And what will happen is the uh, stars will trail in that frame, but in Photoshop, I'll take the sky out of that frame and put just the foreground on top of the stacked image of the stars. So we stack the frames in sequator and freeze the ground. And then we combine the stacked star frames with the foreground image as layers in a Photoshop document, removing the stars from the foreground. So here's an example. There's the camera set up. Uh, this is up at uh, Fayette State Park up in the Upper Peninsula. The foreground frame is uh, of the uh, smelter and the stacked star frames are of the Milky Way behind the smelter. I used uh, 20 frames for this one. I used 10 frames taken before I did the smelter and then I did 10 frames after I did the smelter. And that was to, uh, to kind of make sure that the stars would be in the right place and that uh, I wouldn't have uh, uh, everything shifted over to one side or the other as I assembled the, the composite image. Here's another one. And if you look at this one, uh, you'll see the Milky Way. This is also up at Fayette State Park. Uh, this is like the uh, company headquarters, and this is the hotel up there. And there's a road that goes down through the middle, and the Milky Way runs uh, right above this road. That's what I was trying to show. What I wasn't trying to do is to get these little artifacts on the side by the buildings, and that's uh, a result of the uh, the shift in position of exposures. This is something that you're going to get with Sequator when you uh, stack the images, that uh, the, the building's going to shade the stars on this side over here. Yeah. And one more picture from the, the same group. I have to find my cursor again, there it is. This is also the, the same night, 
a little bit later. Uh, early pictures tend to have a little bit more blue in the background because Twilight hasn't completely finished. By the time Twilight completely finishes, you get a good black sky up there. But you do get the, from Sequator a little bit of a horizon effect as well. So watch for, watch for that. Okay, uh, this time we're going to take uh, uh, pictures from uh, the Little Sable Point Lighthouse, which is on the shore of Lake Michigan, about halfway up the state. And this one would be the nightscape image. This was uh, actually one that I did last summer. My daughter was out there to accompany me because I'm getting old and I need a Sherpa to help me carry things around. Um, you can see that uh, the sky is good and dark. Uh, this would have been in August, kind of late at night, around uh, 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. And again, it's about 15 frames <coughs> for making the uh, nightscape picture up there with one long frame to make the uh, foreground part of the image. So the, the stacked images of the night sky and the foreground image are combined in Photoshop to give one overall image. Okay, a recipe for doing time-lapse, uh, very similar. First thing you need to do is determine the length of the finished time-lapse video that you want. Um, if you want to go 30 seconds, if you want to go 15 seconds, if you want to go a minute, you're not going to be getting a whole lot longer in a one-night session because there just isn't that much time in a night when you compress it down to 30 frames per second and you're shooting frames that are uh, a minute long or a half minute long. Then you need to choose the playback frame rate and uh, calculate the total number of frames that you're going to need and create your data set of images with enough frames to make the uh, length of time at the frame rate that you chose. If uh, you're choosing a uh, uh, slow frame rate, 15, second, 15 frames per second, uh, you can get a fairly long playback. If you're choosing 60 frames per second, you're not going to get very long playback time, but you'll get a lot clearer of an image in playback, a lot smoother of an image. Uh, finally, you render all your frames back into the video clip in the After Effects program. And of course, there's a little bit of math involved in all of this, not a lot. Uh, your frame rate, 15 to 60 frames per second, typically 30 frames a second is uh, a good video rate. So you take the uh, duration that you want is going to be the number of frames divided by the frame rate, or you can flip it around the other way, the number of frames that you have to shoot to get your duration divided by the frame rate. Okay, so we're back there at the lighthouse again. And this time we're doing a time lapse. We have uh, chosen a 30 frame per second rate. And we've got the image. And if you watch this uh, clip through when I play it, uh, you'll see something different on the very last frame. So here go the stars. It's getting a little dark at night. Lots of airplanes, uh, lots of satellites. 
my last frame, when I was taking the last frame, I took a flashlight and I shined it on the, the uh, lighthouse to light it up. And that was intended for the uh, light to be available in making uh, uh, a uh, nightscape picture. I didn't need that light for the, the time lapse, but the last frame had it in it, so we get to see it. And the recipe for star trails, again, very similar. You want to determine the angle of rotation that you want the stars to go through. You calculate the number of frames that are required to do it, and you create your data set with that number of frames and render the frames into a, a final image using the startrails.exe program. So the math, easy math. Uh, you need, uh, for one hour time, that's 3,600 seconds. Take your 3,600 seconds, divide it by uh, 15 degrees, let's see, per, uh, per hour, uh, that means that uh, each minute you get uh, 240 frames. So the interval or the, the total number of uh, uh, frames that you want is going to be the number of degrees times 240 divided by the interval, how long your exposures are. So back to the uh, lighthouse example again. Uh, there's the uh, the finished picture, and we've got uh, a nice length of uh, star trail. And because of the the flashlight lighting the lighthouse on the last frame, I'm able to have a, a bright lighthouse in the picture as well. Now, to make things easier so you don't have to carry a scratch pad with you, you can download a piece of software called PhotoPills onto your camera. And what PhotoPills does is it's, it's got the built-in calculators for doing the things for you. And it's got uh, uh, another little tool in it, which uh, is called the planner. And we'll look at the planner first. What that does is it allows you to go to a site, see where the sun is going to rise and set compared to uh, the, the landmarks around you. Um, let me get my cursor over to my control button. And you can see that uh, I took my uh, photo pills out with me a few weeks ago when I went to Yerkes Observatory. I knew where the sun was going to rise and set. I knew where the moon was going to rise and set, so I had an idea of where shadows would be, and I was able to use that part for planning. Then it's got the tool for star trails and the tool for time lapse. If we take a look at the uh, star trails tool first, um, you tell it how long or what uh, angle you want to take, and it tells you how long of an exposure time you need to do that. And if you're shooting time-lapse instead, you tell it the uh, interval, the, the time interval between exposures, and uh, basically how long you want the uh, uh, film clip to last, how long you want to be out in the field and your frame rate. And it will tell you the shooting interval you need and uh, the total number of pictures you have to take. So you can program that into your intervalometer. So now that we've decided to go out and take these pictures, let's talk a little bit about uh, composition. When you take pictures of uh, uh, star trails, <coughs> the uh, thing most people do is they go out and point their camera at the North Star and 
get a picture like this one, which shows the Little Dipper turned into a star trail with uh, Polaris marking the end of the handle of the dipper as a point. But uh, just the star trails themselves don't turn out to be all that interesting all the time. So you might want to uh, uh, add a little bit more into your picture to give it a little bit more composition. In this case, we've got uh, the constellation Orion and there's a tree that is put down in the uh, corner to kind of balance out Orion in the picture. Um, I do want to go back for just a second to that previous picture. The uh, uh, Star Trail picture was taken out the Kalamazoo Nature Center <coughs> at what is the site of the Owl Observatory now, but it was made years before Owl Observatory was there. The uh, uh, Orion picture was taken at Alan Otterson's home near Three Rivers when he lived there. Now, again, we've got uh, a star trail. This time we've moved the, uh, the central point of the star trail kind of to the, the center of the picture, and we've gone with really, really long star trails. These are all night long star trails. Um, for uh, a little bit of framing, I got some trees on either side of Polaris that would uh, give kind of a, a little bit more composition to the image. So foreground and the star trail behind it. You can put the uh, a central point of the rotation any place in your image. In this case, I moved the, uh, the center of rotation into the upper right-hand corner, and I balanced it with a tree down in the lower left-hand corner. So compositionally, it balances out a little bit better than if I didn't have the tree there. Uh, we did catch uh, a shooting star in this picture. Um, if you don't point north, if you point south instead, you get uh, different kind of star trails. And in this case, uh, you'll notice that the uh, trails at the top of the picture are uh, concave upward. The stars at the bottom of the picture are concave downward. And right through the middle of the picture, we have uh, the, the stars traveling in fairly straight lines. Um, this is uh, near the celestial equator. Let me get my cursor over there. And there it is. So along here, these are the stars of Orion's belt right in here. And Betelgeuse and uh, Bellatrix and Rigel and Safe around the sides. Um, so what I did was I let Orion drift out of the trees and up to this point in the sky. Um, the balance is between Orion and the tree over on the other side. So there's, there's the composition element. Um, you've already seen this picture, uh, this is uh, the one that uh, was done as a star trail, and uh, this is, this is uh, uh, showing the result. If you take a real close look at it, you'll see that these are dotted instead of uh, continuous dashes. This is because the camera had the, uh, the noise reduction setting turned on. So it was uh, photographing, then doing a dark frame, and then doing the next photograph, and then a dark frame, and the next photograph, and a dark frame. And what it gives you is kind of a, a dotted pattern. Now, you can intentionally do the dotted pattern. I took one star trail, and I uh, actually wrote a Morse code message in it. 
by uh, selecting which frames to process in the trail and which ones to skip. And you can do that in the, uh, the startrails.exe program. What you get is a list of all the frames and by checking the boxes to turn some on and turn some off, you, you can actually make Morse code messages in the stars. Uh, again, compositionally, uh, having a, a foreground object helps a little bit. In this case, I took uh, a picture. This one is up in uh, Fayette State Park, up in uh, northern Michigan. And I thought the night that I took this, that this was a pretty good picture. But the day after I uh, got it all cleaned up and on the computer, I thought, you know, I could have done that better if I had uh, changed the uh, picture into a horizontal format, slightly wider angle, and uh, positioned Polaris closer to the corner of the building. So after a few weeks, I went back up and uh, made the trip again and took the shot one more time. Now you might notice that uh, the background color in the two shots are a little different. One was taken before twilight had completely ended. The other one was taken after twilight ended. Uh, the difference uh, was kind of in uh, the fact that one was shot later in the year. So on the clock, uh, twilight was ending earlier. Sometimes uh, you think that it's impossible to take a shot because uh, everything's blocking your view in front of you, but uh, star trails are kind of forgiving that way. In this particular case, uh, a polar star trail shot through the trees of my backyard. The trees are illuminated by a street light about uh, a half a block away. And it turned out to be a, a nice composition. Tried one shot by putting the camera right where I'm sitting at this very moment. So I'm shooting through a window and uh, you see the neighbor's house next door. You see uh, a couple of yard lights and you'll see that I've blocked the one yard light kind of closest to the center by putting my webcam right in front of the, uh, the, the light there. And that allowed me to photograph the star trails in the frame of the windows from my den. I have gone up to uh, Lake Leelanau in northern Michigan several times. I have uh, uh, a sister who has a cottage up there, so it makes a, a nice place for me to go in the summer. I photographed the northern lights up there, and I did a star trail up there. This is a an all-night-long star trail. The... Uh, uh, Background is a little bit light because it started before uh, twilight had ended and it ended before twilight, after twilight had started the next morning. Uh, also, the moon was in the sky, so the moon provided the illumination for the foreground objects in this star trail. Uh, you'll notice a dashed line going across the top of the image or about a a third of the way down the image. That dashed line is the International Space Station. As a matter of fact, I've found uh, that when I do star trails, uh, most satellites are too dim to notice, but the International Space Station shows up real well. Um, Startrails.exe has a mode that you can use which allows you to either fade the stars up or fade the stars down, which will help you in being able to see constellations in the star pictures. Up here, you can see the constellation Cassiopeia. Over here, you can see the uh, front half of Ursa Major. And this is basically from the same set of data that the previous picture was from. It's just processing the frames a little differently. Shot from uh, my backyard, just looking up, I decided that I'd do a couple constellation pictures. In this frame, you see the constellation of Pegasus. 
it's easier to see the constellations as uh, short star trails. It's a little more difficult to see them when you do them as point images. So doing star trails has a benefit for helping people to be able to see some of the shapes in the stars. Over here, little constellation Delphinus. And uh, I decided to go out uh, a couple weeks ago and take a quick trip uh, to around the bottom end of Lake Michigan and up into Wisconsin, where I visited Yerkes Observatory. And uh, while there, I met Kyle Cudworth, who I saw is on the program tonight. He's, he's watching the program. This is uh, one of the pictures that I got showing the International Space Station going above the observatory. Um, I used a really wide angle lens. And you'll notice that uh, the observatory has a little bit of keystone distortion on it. I decided that I'd like to have a picture that shows the observatory uh, a little more upright. So I uh, went back into Photoshop. I, I restacked the pictures without the first few frames so that I get a darker sky. Uh, I would get a little bit more of the, the lighting from the uh, pathway lights along the side of the observatory and uh, that I wouldn't have the, uh, the ISS moving across the view. And this is the final image that I got from that. Now, one other thing that the star trails are good for, um, if the stars are moving, uh, it allows you to take pictures of stellar spectra using just a, a simple prism. If you take a look at this, I've got the, the camera on the tripod. And I've, I've actually not put the, uh, the intervalometer on there yet, but it will have an intervalometer on it. And I'm shooting through a right angle prism. The bottom half of the prism down here is blocked off with black paper. And then I put a black shield around it. And I actually put a black shield over the space, the gap between the prism and the end of the lens. And I was able to take uh, a few star trail pictures that were dispersed, including one of the uh, Belt of Orion. Let's take a look at the Belt of Orion up here and down below at the Sword of Orion. And if you notice something about the uh, middle star in the Sword of Orion, it doesn't look like the others. There's something going on here. And in this case, we're seeing a little bit of uh, nebulosity in this spectra. So I decided to try it out on uh, some of the bright stars and see if I could get a collection showing uh, a variety of different spectra. And using uh, just a, a star trailing through a prism, I was able to get a nice set of uh, spectrographs that uh, can show some differences. And you can actually see uh, dark lines. Some of the uh, uh, molecular lines in Betelgeuse over here, the uh, hydrogen lines over here in Sirius. Uh, there's a few faint lines up in the uh, type B stars up here. And the type O stars, uh, I don't show much of anything in them. So that leads me to uh, kind of wrap things up and we're going to go back to a couple quick time lapses that have uh, some interest because of something going on in uh, about a month's time. Uh, here's a uh, time lapse that was put together of uh, the total eclipse of the moon. And this was uh, shot from my backyard here in Kalamazoo. 
And uh, from the location where the observatory sits today, back before the observatory was built. And it's coming out of the eclipse. This is shot through a 600 millimeter lens. And I uh, kind of shot starting with uh, position, kind of predicting where the moon was going to be at the beginning of the sequence and the end of the sequence so that I can photograph the moon's shadow, uh, the Earth's shadow. So let's take a look at the Earth's shadow. And the way I got this image was by taking those frames that were shot for the time lapse and running them through the uh, software startrails.exe. And that gave me the moon before and after the eclipse as kind of a continuous streak and the dark area in between is the Earth's shadow. And I shot one picture during the uh, mid-eclipse stage. And uh, final image here is uh, one other lunar eclipse, which took place uh, a few years ago. This one was shot from South Haven, Michigan. And what we're going to see is the uh, moon moving through Earth's shadow. And this eclipse actually ended, uh, it went into totality just about the time that the moon set. And of course, moon set on a full moon corresponds to uh, sunrise on the other side of the sky. So there's the setting moon going down into Lake Michigan. And let me see, it looks like there's the end of the show. Okay, so let me stop the share. Hey, Eric, before you stop sharing, I've got a question. Sure. Um, when you were talking about the Photo Pills app, which I know about, but um, the, 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 the screenshot of your phone that was on the left-hand side, you had a couple of widgets on the top, one for the sun and one for the moon. Um, hey, they're part of Photo What was that program? They're part of photo pills. Okay. I haven't played with it. I know about that program. I haven't played with it. I've got something called uh, Photographer's Ephemeris. But I do know about photo pills. I just haven't downloaded it yet. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I got one, Eric. Uh, what file format do you normally shoot in? RAW. Or NEF, if I'm using the uh, the Nikon. That's the Nikon equivalent of RAW. Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, as I'm an out of state, I'm not familiar with the lighthouse, but on a time lapse, um, does the lighthouse lamp rotate? And if so, how did you prevent that from getting into your shot? Uh, <clears throat> repeat the question, please. Um, the lighthouse itself, you said you had a program shot of the lighthouse. Right. Does the, does the lighthouse lamp rotate? Yeah, the lighthouse lens is rotating the whole time, but because I'm uh, shooting 30 second exposures, that that turning lighthouse lamp gets blurred. So all you get is uh, the white top of the lighthouse. Okay, thank you.
Any other questions? We saw the International Space Station go by, and yet there were uh, spots where we didn't see it. Uh, I don't think it's tumbling, so that's the function of the camera. Exposure. Right, that's that's gaps between the exposures. So uh, if I'm shooting uh, 15, 16 second exposures, I'll get uh, probably about eight gaps going across the image. If I'm shooting 25, 30 second exposures, I get about six gaps across an image. Excellent. It makes a nice effect. Uh, without the effect, could you do a long exposure then? If I did a single exposure uh, to get the uh, ISS throughout the whole exposure, I'd be shooting about a six minute long exposure. And then we get star trails again. So, yeah. okay, yeah, you got to make your choices. Thank you. Or, or you can or you can cut down the interval between, right? Uh, the interval between uh, typically five seconds. You could reduce it down to maybe one second, um, but you'd still have a, a drop yeah, in yeah, brightness. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, did you take the photograph that is your desktop? And if so, where is it? Uh, you're seeing my desktop right now? Yes, yes. We, can't, oh. we, can't, we can't see you. <laughs> it's I, I, beautiful. We're not sure what I it is. I guess you're on. That is uh, the Fayette State Park. Um, the, you see the foundry that I had the picture of Milky Way over. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see the, uh, uh, the the company store over here in the corner. I photographed the uh, Polar Star Trails over one of the corners of this building. Right. And best time to go up there is kind of uh, late August, September. And uh, into October, you get the changing colors. It's really beautiful, thank you. I should uh, go back to having the my own picture show up. So yeah, let's see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta come over here and uh, turn well, that off. Well, while you're doing that, somebody else can ask a question. Hearing none. All right. Well. Uh, Go ahead and call it a talk. So thank you very much, Eric. That was wonderful. Looking forward to doing some Star Trail this summer. All right, before we move on um, to, the, to our regular business or uh, discussion, uh, there is a special announcement I want to do. And we've been working on this for a while. At least I've been hoping to do this for a while. Uh, as many of you know, for many, many years, for uh, 20 years, we did a holiday party at the Kalamazoo Area Math and Science Center. And of course, we haven't been able to do anything like that during the pandemic. We, we were hoping to do a, you know, change it up a bit, uh, do what we call a winter solstice dinner party at like a restaurant or hotel or something like that. And of course, uh, we had to cancel it the past two years, so we couldn't do what I wanted to do. So come this December 3rd, uh, we're hoping to hold uh, our first annual uh, winter solstice dinner party and during the party we would like to present a lifetime membership to Eric Schroer if he accepts so Eric I hope you can uh, accept our uh, honor of a lifetime membership and join us on December 3rd I see a thumbs up so fantastic it is well earned and it is well overdue so we can give Eric a little round of applause for both the talk and over you know 50 years of work with the club. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, move on with the rest of the SIG meeting here. Uh, does anybody have any uh, recent uh, images to share? 
I know some of you have been working on shots. I know both uh, Pete and Lloyd have been working on pictures. I've been working on pictures, but the club is very demanding and I never get the process when I want to. But if anyone has any recent images, now's the time to share them. I did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> All right. It doesn't look like we got anything. I can but... get one in there, uh, Richard. Okay. okay. I'll try to share my screen here. Oh, I don't see it yet. We see your Zoom screen, <laughs> your web browser. You got, oh, where am I here? You got my desktop we got, yet? We got your desktop now, yep. Okay. Well, I kind of got my shortest and longest pictures I've ever taken. Well, I'll show this one first. You want moon shots here, right? Oops. Uh, we, we were going to do that a little later, but you, if you want to show one now, but yeah. Okay, well, this is the only one I got. And you so this is to... why people should look at the agenda. <laughs> oh, okay, I can wait. But... <laughs> I know you wanted to see it, but. Yeah. Uh, that's one I took with the Canon 60DA. Same one as uh, Eric's got, actually, I believe. Through the Takahashi 106 in the raw format. Two and a half second shot. Uh, 530 vocal length. So that was uh, the moonshot I thought we wanted to see. Uh, I got a couple here. This is an interesting shot of uh, Cirrus. This is actually the Hubble palette that I use. It's only a 36 minute exposure. And I got this soccer ball effect. I've never seen that before. So it's kind of interesting for just a 36 minute exposure in the Hubble palette. Do you see that uh, the color changes? Uh, in the Hubble palette, in each uh, band, I can get it. Uh, I think the two of them I could see the, like the soccer ball effect and one I couldn't. I couldn't remember which one was which So, But this is a 36 minute quick exposure. And uh, this here is uh, my longest picture I believe I ever taken. The Flaming Star Nebula. This is uh, 31 hours that I got into it. I got like eight hours of hydrogen alpha, 10 hours of sulfur and over uh, 12 hours of oxygen in it. So this is my longest picture I've ever taken. And this is IC405 uh, and down here is IC410. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see these right here. They're called the tadpoles. Yeah. I can kind of zoom in in it a little bit here, show them. I'm not sure how good they're gonna show up there, but. There's the tadpole, the IC410. So that's all I got, Richard. That's pretty good, Dave. Uh, Thank you. I have uh, one uh, solar uh, sunspot. All righty. Go ahead, Arya. Um, how can I share it? Where can I? Uh, I don't see the share button. It's the green button at the bottom, right in the middle. Oh, I see it, I see it. Uh, this is the one I took about, about a couple of weeks ago, the sunspots. Very good. Nice. But uh, I was hoping to see uh, northern lights, but uh, you know, the, the cloud cover is, uh, has been there for a long time. Can you share date, details of the equipment you use? Oh, this is a, like a 400 millimeter um, lens on the ca Canon camera uh, with a sol um, um, solar um, filter. Thank you. Uh, I use a very high shutter speed. I, I took different ones, uh, you know, different uh, uh, settings. Well, you're gonna give us a seizure, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's all. All right. Hey, Richard, I got I got mine. 
Okay. I'm working on. I can figure this out. This is taken with my new uh, 12 inch F4 uh, Newtonian. Let's see here. It's M106 um, through LRGB. Um, ah, color but, now. Yep, got color finally. The luminance is uh, 10, 10 minutes, uh, 46 of them, and then um, 25 minutes for each uh, red, green, and blue. Um, got pretty deep on this. There's some a lot of galaxies I, I still haven't been able to identify in any any of the catalogs. So I'll probably have to go online. But um, overall, I've been really happy with this uh, big scope. A lot of nice little interacting pair down down here. Nice little face-on oh, yeah. spiral down there, and then you get all these. Whoops! I'll make everyone puke here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you got all sorts of little little galaxies here, a little edge on, they're all over the place. Slowly Fantastic. getting the scope. What's that? Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. So this is probably my last picture with a CCD because I just bought a new new camera. So going, uh -oh. over, going over to the CMOS side. Uh oh. Mike Sinclair is not here, so I'll say it for him. I hate you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, having a big light bucket is it really is good, nice. <laughs> All right. Any other fresh images from the camera? All right. Moving on. Um, as uh, usual, I, I, I always like good. to mention, are there any interesting images from other astrophotographers that any, anyone saw online that you really wanted to share? Yeah, I have. Gregory? Yeah, hi. Um, can I share my screen? I have some. I you should be able there. to. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Oh, uh, white. We see white. Oh, jeez. Big bang. Could be. <laughs> All right. Screen share. Uh, entire window. A rare picture of the other side of a black hole. <laughs> oh, it's a white <laughs> hole. Do you see it now? S -s -s Still not white. white. <laughs> That's odd, because when I try to do screen share, it says entire screen. Oh, uh, now it's... Can you see it now? I think it's working this time. It's uh, taking a second. That's your name. It's not popping up. Oh, there we go. We got it. We got it. Oh, you got it? Yep. Okay, okay great. Okay, okay, great. Well, well, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Greg Shanus. I'm, uh, I'm Greg Shanus. Um, I took... Um, I took um, I, I took Richard Bell's course, five part series. I have my official certificate now. And, uh, but I've been an amateur astronomer since 1985 when Halley's Comet came. I live down in Florida and I'm into the planetary imaging more. And uh, here's some of my images. This is Jupiter with a methane filter. And then um, I have all the information here. These are some older shots. And then this is a uh, Venus with a um, ultraviolet filter. And then this is Mars with a uh, one shot color. And then, um, and then this is infrared. And then this is for screening for blue clearing. And then here's uh, Jupiter uh, color infrared and then methane. And then there's um, Venus. And then uh, this shot I'm really proud of. This is um, Ganymede here and uh, shadow transit of Ganymede. And I blew it up a little bit, about two, three times the size. And then here's a Cassini spacecraft image taken December 3rd, 2000. Look at that, you can see a lot of the detail. Isn't that amazing? In, uh, in Ganymede, and then this is a recent one of uh, 
Venus I took 329-2022. You can see the, the clouds, the, the darker uh, features here, the cloud bands. And then this is my uh, telescope collection. I'm a Mead man, back when Mead was great. <laughs> and uh, here's Saturn, one shot color IR, and then uh, with the methane band. Oh, and then th this I'm really proud of. This was taken all on the same night on October 11, 2020. And, uh, and notice I started at zero hours UT, 054.01, and then uh, four hour, three hours for Neptune, four hours. And then technically this was the next day for me in the morning. But in universal time, it's the same day. It's 11 hours because this is midnight universal time. So th th these are all in the same day. Isn't that cool? I got all but Mercury, which wasn't out at the time. And then I have it here. This is ultraviolet and these are infrared. And that's it. So I really enjoyed... Um, Agia's talk, he, he was really great. Agapios. Yeah. Huh? Agapios. Agapios. Yeah. Agapios, yeah, his, his talk was really great with the planetary imaging. So, okay, that's all I have. So I just wanted to introduce myself. And man, this club is really amazing. I mean, you guys get some real special people. You're going to have, uh, I can't wait to hear um, Dr. Alex Filipenko next month. That, that's really amazing. Well, we hope you can get in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm already registered. Well, that doesn't guarantee you can get in. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, move on. Did here. I stop we'll, sharing? Yeah, I, I, I stopped sharing for you. Uh, oh, so okay. we'll, we'll just skip the interesting images from other astrophotographers, but Perhaps we can double back to that later. Uh, of course, it sounds like Mumbauer already mentioned uh, some new astrophotography related equipment software that he purchased. So, uh, Pete, what camera did you get? Got to unmute myself. You do. I uh, know, I'm getting better at that. Um, I ordered a, a, a QHY uh, 294 model. Um, and I also had to get uh, some 36 millimeter. Uh, filters from Astronomic. I have inch and a quarters, but I'm vignetting so horrible with my inch and a quarters on the 12 inch because it's an F4. The light cone is so, you know, real steep. So that's what I got coming right now. That's still a crop sensor, right? You didn't go full frame? No, I'm not oh. going full frame. Oh, come on. I'm, yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that, <laughs> I'm not rich. <laughs> no. So uh, this, uh, it's a pretty big chip. It's, you know, 4,000 by 2,000. One thing I liked about it is you can run it in two modes. Um, standard mode is just that 4,000 by 2,000 and the pixels are 4.6 microns. And then you can un unlock it because what they do is do a hardware binning of it. So you can unlock the other mode and you get a, a 47 megapixel camera that's 8,300 by 5,600 with like two micron. Uh, pixels so it'd be great for my short refractor and then use the other mode for the bigger scope but we'll see it shows up they said monday actually the place actually called up the day said you yeah you know, i can get it to you faster if you do ups i'm like oh, how much more is it going to cost oh don't worry about it i'm like okay <laughs> well yeah why do they even ask if they can do it faster for the same price just, just do it faster. well they, <laughs> they thought maybe i didn't like ups uh oh okay so because i picked u.s postal service i'm like oh that was cheaper i'll just get that but anyway yeah. so yeah looks so i got a mono cmos coming Let's see how that better be better <laughs> yeah i don't know I used to have the color version of that camera um so i was pretty happy with the noise uh real low noise on it so one thing i don't like is the bigger filters oh, not yeah. as big as the club filters but no anyway that's all i got all right anybody else purchase any new equipment for astrophotography all right uh moving on here uh next up 
uh, Anna Daly uh, wants to give a little short uh, uh, spiel about Astronomical League observing awards and with imaging, because there are some, some you can do with uh, your camera. So Anna, you want to tell us about those? Of course, you want to unmute yourself. That will help, yes. Yeah, I do want to talk about those. Um, if any of you have been coming to our regular uh, general meetings, then you'll know that uh, recently we've been giving out some awards for the Astronomical um, Society, or no, Astronomical League Observing Programs. And they have close to 70 programs. Um, and you may not realize that almost half of those can include imaging. Um, I enjoy doing the, the League programs because it gives me some kind of direction for what I'm doing, uh, some kind of goal to work towards. Um, so th there's a whole range of them. Uh, there's solar programs, lunar programs, planetary, stars, comets, asteroids, galaxies, occultations. Um, they do sometimes special ones for the eclipses. I uh, just wanted to go through a few um, of the programs right here. One of them is specifically made for imaging called Foundations of Imaging. I put the link to the Astronomical League website in the chat. Um, and that gives you just a list alphabetically of all of them. But when you click on the one, you wanna look at this little quick guide over here and it'll tell you, you're looking for the ones that have an eye in the visual imaging, meaning you can do imaging. Um, but it's also gonna give you some tidbits about whether you need a telescope. Um, the M or DA means it, is it manually, are you manually pointing your telescope or can you use a go-to? And a lot of them also allow use of a remote telescope. So if you are signed up through KAS for the remote telescope, uh, you can use those on a number of these too. And they'll also give you some general information about how many images there are. Sometimes it'll tell you how, what kind of, what size of telescope that you would need to complete that program. Um, and it's gonna give you some general information about the goals, uh, and the requirements, a lot of these are going to require that you uh, make a note of your latitude, your longitude, the date, the time, the equipment that you use. Some also require that you have, make a description of the object. The fundamentals and imaging, as you can see, it kind of touches a little bit on every program. It's a, like an all-around imaging program. And it'll list the specific requirements. Uh, for each one, this kind of has a solar system section and a deep sky section. And then at the bottom of every page, uh, they're gonna also have some links to some uh, kind of things to help you, a list of right, solar system objects, deep sky objects, imaging software, etc. cetera. Uh, I know a lot of you like to take pictures of nebula. So there's actually two different nebula ones, bright nebula and dark nebula. Uh, this one has two different levels, I think, Actually, I think for imaging, you have to do the 100 images. Um, and some of them do have a specific list that you need to pick from, uh, and you'll find those down at the bottom. And then for those of you who like the sun, uh, there's hydrogen alpha solar program. This one has uh, specific things you have to do, 20 or more images of the whole solar disk over the course of two rotations. Uh, so that's like 60 days. And then you also have to get some of these specific features of the sun, arches, uh, mounds, pyramids, filaments, sunspots, uh, et cetera. And then um, this one you have to also do transparency and seeing, which like, how do you test that? How do you know what that is for a daytime image? So it gives you kind of a guide here of how to measure that and also how to submit your images. So. I hope that some of you take the time to uh, look at those and uh, maybe we'll be handing out some awards to you guys at some point. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, it looks like I never heard of, never knew this existed. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. All right, thank you, Anna. You're welcome. Okay, so as uh, Eric uh, noted first, we have a total lunar eclipse coming up. So I encouraged uh, members to share uh, past lunar eclipse images they may have shared. So I figured I would go first. 
I basically looked through all the uh, uh, PowerPoints uh, of astrophotos that I've taken from past astrophoto nights and just uh, combined them together in this little short show. It's like 30 some odd slides, but I'm gonna zip through it really fast. I have lunar eclipse images, uh, at least on my uh, hard drive, uh, going back to 2004, but I'm sure I have uh, 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 slides of even uh, previous lunar eclipses that I took, but I'll show you the last three that I have uh, images of. So the first one is the total lunar eclipse of October 8th, 2014. This was an early morning eclipse, and so I went to the uh, Kalamazoo Nature Center all by myself. There wasn't anyone there and I set up my own equipment because we couldn't do it from Owl Observatory or I, I couldn't do it from Owl Observatory. And I always start, of course, with a picture of the full moon, mainly to get the uh, telescope focused. So here's a shot of the full moon. This is with my old uh, Thomas M. Beck or TMB 92 SS refractor, which is incredibly sharp. Uh, I sold it to Don Stilwell. And of course, he's just a visual guy, so that's a good astrophotoscope uh, going to waste there on some visual person. It's terrible. And I do remember this eclipse very well. It took me a second to remember it, but again, this was the early morning eclipse, and the thing that I remember the most is the kind of long grass at the Nature Center got really wet. And so uh, just before sunrise, my feet were soaking wet. Uh, so I remember having very, very cold, wet feet that night. So you can see uh, this is a 1 200th uh, second shot at ISO 100 with a uh, Canon T2i or 550D uh, on my Astrophysics Mach 1. Pretty much all this information here for these slides will stay the same, except for the exposure that might change a little bit. But of course, uh, with the full moon, and with digital, you can take several exposures, you know, do, do bracketing, maybe one 200th looks best on your screen, but, you know, do like, you know, one 250th and one 400th or, you know, one 100th or something like that. So, you know, try to snap a few pictures and you can uh, see which one works best later. Because sometimes they look different on the computer screen than they do on the camera screen. So they're not always exactly the same. So no, no action here yet. But we can go to the next slide. I don't have these lined up perfectly. Otherwise, it would look like kind of a cool time lapse like Eric showed. But here you can start to see the uh, moon sliding on. I, I did step it down to 125th, but um, that's just the one that I just happened to chose. I'm sure I have one at 1 200th. We can just kind of keep going here. You can see there's 1 100th. Back to 1 125th. And just watch that shadow creep along. You can see the effects of the uh, penumbra. And this would be the umbra here, the, the darker shadow, the not so dark shadow. So of course here, there's still direct sunlight. Here, there's no sunlight. And it's just creeping along there. You can, uh, again, watch the exposure time if you're curious about that. Everything else is pretty much the same. And of course, visually, you can watch the shadow creep across the surface and cover up craters. You can do crater timing to get a sense of the exact timing because you know lunar eclipses aren't, aren't as precise as solar eclipses. And that's because of the state of Earth's atmosphere. It, it tends to get puffed up and shrink back down with perhaps solar activity and so on. So now you see the exposures are getting a little uh, uh, longer because the moon's getting more and more covered up. And you'll gradually see the exposures get longer and longer, or I mean, shorter and shorter. This one's a little overexposed, but I think what I was going for here is to see if I could start to pick up hints of red, but really at a half second, you really can't do that. So now I go to uh, 3.2 seconds. And of course, the uh, directly illuminated portion of the moon is really overexposed, but you can start to see some hints of a coppery red color. But the deeper it gets, the better it gets. Now we're up to eight full seconds. And this doesn't even look like the start of totality yet, but we're getting there. And by now, this is probably totality. You'll notice uh, usually the moon doesn't turn entirely cop coppery red because it rarely ever plunges deep into the Earth's umbra. So here it probably skimmed, you know, just kind of the, the northern portion of the Earth's umbra. So we still get uh, some bright illumination here, but there's no really direct sunlight quite at this stage anymore. 
And you can see I did a really long, I, I, I can back up there, but I did like a really long exposure here. Usually I prefer to do ISO 100, but um, if your mount isn't really as capable as say an astrophysics Mach 1, uh, you can step it up to like ISO 400 or 800 and do much shorter exposures. But I like to keep the ISO setting as low as I can uh, to keep noise down. So 13 seconds is pretty long. And even here's a 30 second one, which I'm shocked it's not really, really uh, overexposed here. So this kind of proves with 30 seconds that there really is no direct sunlight because this would be like just really so bright if there was direct sunlight there. And now you can see the effects of how the uh, the moon changes when it's uh, during totality with uh, plunging further and further into to the shadow. So here's uh, the last shot for the 2014 eclipse. This was part of a series of what they call a uh, tetrad, I think, uh, lunar eclipses, like a series of four. And here's the next one that we had uh, not quite a year later. Uh, so this is September 27th, 2015. I won't show as many this time. You'll notice previously, uh, just back up here real quick, I uh, used a 2X power mate. And I figured for this eclipse, this time I'll leave the power mate off uh, to maybe try to make the image even a little sharper uh, with bad scene. So again, you can see the exposure is different. Uh, I'm at 1 100th here, which is probably even a little too short because it looks pretty over illuminated here. But again, you can take a you know series of exposures. You can bracket. You got plenty of time to think for a lunar eclipse as opposed to a total solar eclipse. And uh, I'm not sure if we had, I, I think we had a little bit of cloudy weather that night. This was at Richland Township Park. I was surrounded by uh, uh, students and the public because we had a big public event at Richland Township Park. And uh, the partial phases were really, really hard to get because of cloud cover. But it did clear up for like a good 20 minutes to get totality. And here's just one of the really, really good shots of totality for that September 2015 eclipse from Richland Township Park. You know, it picks up a lot of background stars at just four seconds at ISO 100. The moon was a lot higher than it was for the other eclipse too. And then here's just another uh, parting shot. Uh, but most recently, we had the uh, January 2019 lunar eclipse. I'm not going to show you a, a whole series of images, but we were hoping to have a special event for this one at the Nature Center. But even though it was clear, it was incredibly cold. So we decided to cancel because we prefer members, you know, not die at club events. Uh, so we did not do that. But here's the one picture from the eclipse that I'm going to share because this humble lunar eclipse image uh, that I took with my five inch stellar view because I have since sold the TMB and purchased this for the solar eclipse in 2017. This is by far, I mean by far, my most viewed image ever. And that's because instead of uh, taking pictures at the nature center, I took them from my backyard in Kalamazoo Township and I began uh, live tweeting images. And I believe uh, Phil Plate, the bad astronomer, you know, he, he retweeted some. And then Elon uh, Musk uh, saw it and uh, uh, tweeted it out to his uh, millions of followers. And it went basically viral. Uh, so uh, the number of likes has decreased, I've noticed recently, because even though this has been, what, over three years now, every two weeks, somebody will like uh, his tweet uh, from this. And that'll show up on our Twitter feed. Uh, so, you know, people just go back in time and look at all his uh, tweets because, you know, he has a cult-like following to, to some people. So, again, these are just the retweets and the likes. But, you know, with, with his millions of followers, millions of people uh, have likely seen this image on Twitter. It, it made the uh, front page of Space Weather. This is the second uh, 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 front page image I've gotten on space weather. The first was a Aurora shot years and years ago. If you really look hard, you can find it. But this is my most recent one for the lunar eclipse. And uh, they even featured it on CNET because they did a little story about how Elon Musk, you know, tweeted my photo, but uh, and it went kind of viral. And they did a little story about that. We picked up lots of followers. So, of course, uh, I saw Gregory did his uh, beauty shot of him and his equipment. So here's a beauty shot, well, if you want to call it that, of me and my astrophysics Mach 1 and my 5-inch 
uh, stellar view. This is my little um, 65 millimeter AstroTech. And of course, I'll be taking images of this lunar eclipse with that set up at the Nature Center. And uh, Pete is going to use this truck, which I'm calling Optimus Prime now, because uh, apparently it does everything, even transforms into a robot. At least that's the rumor I'm going to spread. And I'm going to be tweeting uh, uh, pictures of the eclipse again from the Nature Center if all goes well. So if you're not uh, going to attend with us at the Nature Center, because you may live far away, uh, you can uh, view the images on Twitter, especially if you get clouded out. So this is a Sunday. I wish it was like a Friday or a Saturday, but I don't schedule these things. And so, you know, if you do have to get up to work the next day, you know, Monday morning, it's going to be a little bit difficult, but you can at least catch totality and perhaps be home by midnight, you know, uh, to uh, get in bed and get at least some sleep. And of course, we get to see the entire thing. It would be better if Michigan were like like over here instead, but again, we're over here. So that means it's going to be kind of a late night affair, but it's much better than November, you know, which is uh, earlier in the morning and it's November and we're probably not going to see it. So there are some of my more recent lunar eclipse pictures I thought I would zip through really, really fast. Anybody else have any lunar eclipse images from the past you wanted to share that you have at the ready? I got one, Richard. All right, Dave, fire away. I got a couple. All right, now we're talking. Ha, ah, beauty. Yeah, so that's the uh, uh, January 20, 2019. Ah, you survived. Were you indoors or outdoors? <laughs> no, I was out. <laughs> I was inside, so I, so I saved myself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't get yeah, to photograph it was, that one. It was like minus it. two. <laughs> it was like really super oh, cold. It was super cold. Mm hmm Yeah, sure. But that was with my uh, Teleview uh, NP101 IS. Ah. Mm hmm And uh, Canon uh, 5D. Perfect. All right. Very good, Dave. Any others? All right, uh, Kevin, you want to share yours? All right. Let me get this going here. So, Richard, what puts the pretty numbers down the right side of your pictures? The pretty numbers? Well, you had uh, the information about how you took it. Does that count, come out of your camera? No, no. I well, it, uh, some of it's stored in the camera in the EXIF file, but I, I, I put that together just for, you know, for shoe. <laughs> so, so there's not a software package I should know about. No, no, no. There's nothing that, that does that for me. It, it'd be nice. I'm sure there's a way, but I'm not that clever. Is it working? Can you see my screen? Nothing yet. What the heck? We don't see Kevin either. No, he doesn't want us to. Well, I can't get it to work for some reason. Oh, darn. All right. Well, anybody else have oh, any lunar clip shots? Kevin, turn your video on. You, you don't have to have your video on. Just, I, I do it all the time. Give me just a second here. Okay. I need uh, Jeopardy music. I have one. Let's give Kevin another chance here. We'll give him a little more time. Okay. So there we go. Oh, yeah, beauty. Nice white shot. There we go. Well, we're going to go back here. Oh. Uh, this is all the way back in January of 2000. Whoa. Um, it was 12 degrees outside. Um, this is up at the Bean in Grand Rapids. Um, I stepped outside just to get a picture of the part of the dome with uh, totality. Uh, don't know what the exposure time was. But then I, um, I'd been shooting. That's, the, that's totality, right at totality. Uh, January 
was it January 20th, I believe, of 2000. I'm, look, I'm looking at the date right now. Hold on a sec. I think it was February. <laughs> yeah, I think you're um, right. I remember that one because uh, some players Diet Coke froze solid during the, during that one. Yeah, we we had we we didn't used to uh, uh, we didn't used to plow the observatory road, and I had to get somebody to plow it, and I actually had to get out on the roof and shovel the snow away from the dome so I could turn it. So to get to the moon, it was quite an adventure that night. Um, the next, and this was on film because I hadn't went to digital yet. Now we're going to go to actually, uh, where are we at? This is April 15th, 2014. Wow. So exactly um, t- today, back in 2014, eight, eight years, years ago. Eight years ago. Uh, this was we had we had basically a, a like a freezing drizzle night. I don't know if you remember it. Um, totality was about three in, three in the morning. I decided to chance going out to the observatory, and I had a sucker hole right over the observatory that was clear. And a friend of mine at the National Weather Service at the airport, it was snowing. And as the crow flies, that like that's like six miles. This one, you got the the uh, the moon, the little the little star close to the moon. I don't have a pointer. Little star close to the moon is Spica, and the bright star in the upper right is actually Mars. And there's a little bit closer one with the moon, and Spica is the brightest one to the lower right, and. Yeah, that is totality. Um, this was oh, what was it? I got the exit date. Ten seconds with a Canon Seven D. I shot um, this was through the Takahashi up at the observatory. Uh, Four-inch Takahashi with a field flattener and a 2X teleconverter. So those are mine. Very good. All right. Thank you. All right. So we're getting a little long here. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, move on here because I don't want to go too much longer. Um, So we have – I had – if you have the um, uh, agenda for tonight, I have the 2022-2023 uh, uh, schedule. These are all the dates listed from September to April are the third Friday of the month. And uh, so, of course, we're looking for uh, guest speakers to fill those meetings. Um, we kind of we don't have one officially yet, but Agapios, our uh, February speaker, he uh, uh, kind of volunteered the night he gave his talk to do kind of a live Mars imaging session at the December meeting. So, of course, he's uh, uh, like six hours ahead of us or seven hours ahead of us. So for him, uh, at the time we meet, Mars should be high overhead. So uh, we'll probably do that if he agrees on December 16th. Uh, But that, of course, is only one meeting. So we need either uh, club members to volunteer to give a presentation during one of these nights, or we need suggestions from uh, uh, you uh, of outside speakers that we can bring in because uh, poor Richard shouldn't have to do it all by himself. So we do have, do we have any uh, volunteers in the club to give a talk? So uh, Pete, what do you think you'd want to talk about and when? You got to unmute yourself, of course, again. How embarrassing. It is terrible. <laughs> terrible. Um, boy, I haven't really thought that far ahead. I mean, I could well, do like okay. a November, December. Um, November, December? Um, Not December, but November would be good. Okay. Um, well, you, you don't have to give me a topic now, but... Yeah. If there was a spe- specific month you wanted to grab now, you could go ahead and do that. Yeah, November would be good. Is that available? Okay. Yeah, so we can put you down. I'll, I'll kind of make a note here for uh, November. 
So we'll put uh, Mumbauer. I'll even make sure I spell it right. <laughs> um, anybody else want to uh, volunteer to give a talk sometime next year? Like uh, Lloyd, you could talk about Nina or something. I read my mind. That's exactly what I was going to just say. Oh, perfect. D did you have a month you wanted to grab now before we, uh, before we start looking for other people? It doesn't really matter. Okay. We'll keep that in mind. I'll just kind of put your name at the bottom then. Yeah. I, actually, it popped in my head. Maybe I could do a talk about calibration frames, you know, darks, oh. flats, right, right way to take them, when to use them. CCD, CMOS, blah blah blah. All right, well, you got you got time you got you got time to think about it. <laughs> yeah, no, that'd be a good one. I mean, I know a lot of people get tripped up on it. So, okay. All righty. Any other volunteers to give a talk? All right. How about uh, has anyone done their homework like I asked them to do last month and looked for uh, possible outside speakers? Uh oh. Well, see, there, there, there lies in the problem. So you still have time to work on this, but I would like to start sending out invites uh, within the next uh, few weeks. So I will try to uh, remind some of you to do that. You know, again, um, give me at least a couple of suggestions in case uh, one of them doesn't work out. There are, of course, people I have in mind all the time because my my mind is perpetually thinking of stuff like this for, for general meetings. And so I'm just kind of used to doing it for uh, SIG meetings um, as well. But uh, again, you know, one, one, per, one person shouldn't have to do it all. It's called the Kalamazoo Astronomical hey, Society. Yeah. Um, I know you're not on Facebook and I'm not on anymore, but there's the Michigan Amateur Astronomy Group. I think Pete's in that group, aren't you? Yeah, I am. There's a lot of imagers in there that maybe they might want to give talks. Yeah, actually, there's a guy in there who's, I think he's sponsored by Celestron and OPT, um, uh, Jason something. Um, anyway. Where? Blaska? Uh, no, he, Jason Blaska, I think. Oh, Blaska, yeah. No, he, he, no, he's no, in no. central Michigan. Uh, uh, okay, hold on. Let me... He just posted a... But there's a couple of people... A lot of them are on the other side of the state, but they, they do really good work and they might be interested in, yeah. you know, giving like a Zoom talk. It, yeah, it doesn't, of course, it does not have to be local. We've more than learned with Zoom. We can have people all over the world, really. I, I thought we were kind of limited to the U.S., but remember, Agapios joined us from freaking Cyprus. <laughs> and, and that was, I think, one of our more popular talks. People are still talking about it. Okay, so again, get your wheel moving. You know, uh, if you see like a cool YouTube video of someone talking about astrophotography and you think they'd make a great speaker, you know, write it down, email it to me. And, uh, you know, Richard could, could use some help. Um, hey, Richard. Can, yeah. Can I share my screen a second? Uh, sure. Yeah. So this is the guy, Jason uh, Gunzel. He's over. Oh, vast reaches, yeah. Yeah, he's over on the east side, but his work is, I think he's had some A-pods and stuff. I mean, he does hmm. phenomenal work, but I think he'd be a great, especially being Michigan-based, um, fairly local. You're going too fast. Sorry, I'm not going to make you puke, but like his solar work he's done is pretty good. Anyway, I think it'd be a good... All right. Well, if you can get his information, I, I'm trying to jit it down here a little, but it, if you want to send me his information, please, uh, pl please do. Yeah, I just got to figure out how to reach him. And I do know that Jason, we or, uh, not Jason Ware, and I got Jason Ware on the mind. Uh, um, <laughs> Adam Block, he offered to come back and talk more about Pix Insight. And of course, if we do meet in person again, I mentioned I have the uh, uh, like a nightscape and time lapse uh, video series from Alan Dyer. That's not something we could do on Zoom for copyright issues. So it had to be something just for local people, unfortunately. So uh, those of you that live out of state will just have to buy it and watch it on your own. But I talked about that during the lecture series. If you wanted to learn more, you can look that up in part five. Uh, so we're again, we're running longer than I thought here, but uh, let's. 
mention uh, more equipment that uh, has been purchased, but this is for the KAS. So we've talked about, uh, you may have heard us talk about the issues we've been having with the Takahashi, is that, you know, star images around the edge don't look pinpoint, as pinpoint, nearly as pinpoint as they should. So we've kind of determined that we're pretty certain that's the cause is the camera and filter wheel is way too heavy and the focuser can't hold it. So I contacted uh, Moonlight yesterday because uh, OPT can't uh, sell me anything from Moonlight because Moonlight is doing everything directly because of shortages and stuff like that. And uh, so we're going to order one of these puppies here, this big red thing on the back of this similar Takahashi. So this is a Moonlight uh, Nightcrawler. Oh, dang it. Richard is clocking. Richard is clocking. <sighs> Dang it. I got knocked off again. Um, so let, 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 let me try this again. I'm not sure where I left off. Uh, just tell us about it. Don't show the picture. You're well, just trying to share. Here's the uh, here's the focuser we're gonna get. It's from Moonlight, uh, called the Nightcrawler. It is very very high end. It holds uh, 25 pounds, and it is not cheap. Uh, so we're uh, hopefully we'll have this. Uh, I doubt it'll be ready to go by the time we bring the remote scope back online from the hiatus this summer. But uh, there you go. So uh, this is what we're working on to upgrade the Takahashi and make it uh, super super sharp. So you're getting the 35, the three and a half inch? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. The really expensive one, <laughs> which is what we need for the tack. You need and it then, for the giant chip, man. You need it. Yeah, for our giant chip, we need it. And the tilt plate also. Yes. And uh, for our observatory, uh, you know, we, we already have a ZWO ASI 071 in there, which is great for deep sky. It, it can be used for planetary, but I haven't found it terribly great or convenient to use for planetary. So I wanted to get something more dedicated. So we ordered a ZWO ASI 462, which is currently shipped to us. So it is on the way. And uh, thanks to Agapios, we ordered one of these uh, 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 ZWO atmospheric dispersion correctors. And I went ahead and got a, uh, a inch and a quarter uh, UV IR cut filter. So if you're looking to do some solar, lunar, planetary imaging, um, and maybe don't have your own equipment or just want to do it at the Nature Center, we'll, we'll have that at Al, Al Observatory uh, very, very soon. So th those are the upgrades to the remote telescope and Al Observatory that we are working on for you. And the last thing I want to mention is, of course, uh, as noted, this is our last uh, uh, SIG meeting until uh, September, most likely. But we do have at least kind of one event planned for over the summer. Is uh, For years, Dave Garden has been inviting us to his property at the Huron-Manistee National Forest. And so we're looking to maybe uh, get together up there on uh, from roughly August 26th to Monday, August 29th. Uh, I'm sure Dave will tell you that you can possibly arrive earlier or stay later, but it just depends on how long he's up there. Right, Dave? Yep, I'll be up there early and late. Okay. So uh, this will be mostly for astrophotographers, but uh, we can invite visual people as well. Uh, we are limited to, what'd you say, Dave, roughly a dozen to 15? Yeah, I figure I'm counting on about five people already. I got room maybe for 10 more. And if they're bringing trailers or they're camping. And tent. Tents, no problem. Trailers, I can probably hold three or four medium-sized ones. Great. So you said the skies are up there. You want to give us a little uh, spiel about the skies? Uh, I'm not sure of the Boral rating up there, but you get a good clear night. You can see the dark lanes in the Milky Way, no problem. You said you've, you've seen Milky Way horizon the horizon out there? It's not as good as it used to be years ago, but it's oh. pretty close. All right. Well, we hope the weather's good and we can uh, get up there and do some imaging. So we are looking forward to it. So if there's nothing else, uh, we will go ahead and officially adjourn our last meeting of our first season. Thank you, everyone.